Hello and welcome to this podcast, episode 33. I'm John Furrier with Dave Vellante, extracting the signal from the noise. Uh, very busy, interesting week. I'm on the road. I'm in North Carolina. I had some visits here um, for uh, meeting SAS, Dave, with the SAS Championship. I played in their pro-am, met some of the founders, doing a big story on Research Triangle Park. Um, welcome to episode 33. Great to, great to be connected via hey, Zoom. Um, hope the audio comes out okay for the folks listening. Apologize, but I wanted to get the streak going. 33 podcasts. Uh, numbers are update. People love the podcast. love when we riff. But this week, this is not a lot of riffing with really the, the top stories being the war in Israel is just you know, insane. The whole thing that went down, the terrorist attack, uh, the Hamas just basically just invaded Israel. Um, and, you know, besides the dramatic piece rupture that happened because you know israel's traded land for peace basically um, years ago and it's just been um horrific you know and not without its consequences to the tech industry as you know silicon valley is you know heavy with israeli startups tel aviv well known it's like the silicon valley in the area um i've talked to at least a few founders already on the phone multiple multiple uh founders in the middle of rounds of funding um, with their teams over there. I mean, every company that's in tech has a tech team in Israel. Uh, we know uh, Infinidad has a team. So, you know, Eric Herzog and others talking about that as well. Just, Dave, I mean, this is just unacceptable. I mean, I just my, I'm standing with Israel and this is just incredibly difficult. Um, and just the invasion, it's a terrorist attack. Uh, and, you know, obviously the cybersecurity angle here is not to be ignored. You know, what's going to happen? It's really, it's crazy. I mean, it's just mind boggling, the whole consequences of what this means. So I think, um, uh, I, I also, I, I don't know if you know this, John, our lead security journalist, David Strom, his daughter lives in Israel and has for years, a couple of years anyway, maybe even more. And her husband was called I, in to do service. I did not know that. Yeah, so, you know, he's, they're obviously, you know, incredibly, con I mean, everybody is incredibly concerned. And, you know, I get my Wall Street journals here, every headline this week is- I mean, they're is, picking is, up is, body is, parts, you know. I mean, I mean, it's just, it, it's, it's good. I, the, 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 yeah. Of course, the greatest concern for both, both the war in Ukraine and now in Israel is the escalation. You know, this is, this is how world wars start, right? They start, you know, you get sort of, you, you know, little cold conflicts and then they turn into to, to wars, regional wars, and then those regional wars suck in other nations and then allies have to come to support other nations. And then before you know it, you know, you, you have a, a world war going on and, and we've never had a world war where there was, you know, m massive nuclear armaments all over the world and gosh knows, we don't want to see that. Um, you know, it's crazy. And so I'm really, really concerned about escalation. Um, I'm, I'm concerned about the, I mean, if look at, if you're Israel, we had, we had the same feeling after 9-11. It's like, you know, get those guys. <clears throat> and now you're seeing what's happening in Gaza. Today, it was, you know, the news is Israel's basically saying, warning citizens, get out. You know, you got to go south. And so, of course, those folks are like, oh, how do I get out? <laughs> you know, there's no taxis. I got I have my family and I got to pick up everything and go. And so that's a cluster. And then they're going to roll in and, and it appears they're just going to, you know, really flatten Gaza. Um, and, and so what is that going to bring? And w will other nations, you know, get involved? Is Hezbollah going to get involved? You know, what's Iran going to do? And if that if Iran gets involved, what's the United States going to do? And then you've got the U.S. and China, the two superpowers, which are right now not in a great place. But it could could go one of two ways, John. It could get worse, or we could start having some diplomatic discussions and make it get better. And the the latter is the better outcome. If the two world superpowers can get together, and and, and calm things down in ukraine i don't know middle east that's a, they're they're different but they are sort of related in terms of just the 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 global and geopolitical implications but let maybe start with ukraine if the united states and china the two world superpowers could somehow broker peace 
in Ukraine, that would be a good outcome and a good start. And again, I, I don't know what the answer is in Israel. It's, it's a decades long, millennial well, the Hamas problem. Promise. The Hamas thing has just got to be eliminated. I mean, the, the Palestinians, the, 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 there's friends on that side too, but it's just they get pigeonholed with the, with, uh, the terrorists, right? So, you know, humanity is at risk here. It's a huge issue, pivotal moment in history. Um, but here's the problem, John, is you said Hamas has to be eliminated, but first of all, Israel has tried before to, to wipe out Hamas, not, not to the scale that it's going to happen now. <clears throat> you know, the concern there is, you know, people say Hamas <clears throat> is not, I mean, it is an organization, obviously, but it's also an ideology that's, that, that you know, the concern is something else will rise up. And it's, it, it, we've seen over history, just more and more escalation. Um, so, but I understand what you're saying, and I think Netanyahu has basically said, we're going to wipe them out this time. So they're going to go house to house. And then what happens to the hostages? Can you imagine if you had, you know, one of your loved ones taken hostage and you see the tanks rolling in and they're threatening to, you know, execute these people, these, these barbaric executions, and they put them out live on, on social media. And it's just heartbreaking. Well, there's also going to be a lot of action on cybersecurity. So there's also, as we, you know, we read a story this week on Silicon Angle, the uh, Amos Israeli war is going to be fought in cyberspace. Check that out. Um, so obviously that's there. Just, you know, um, a lot of, you know, tech news continues to go along. We actually fe featured uh, an Israeli startup, Kubia. They just um, launched a new suite of AI services. Um, so it was really cool to see them get some headlines. Um, could be, a, you know, have a chat GPT for DevOps, basically it's platform engineering. Um, another company, Tabby ML raised 3.2 million for open source coding assistant will be at KubeCon this year in a couple of weeks, next month, uh, when they're going to be there. So, uh, Linux foundation, and the cloud native, um, world will have a lot to discuss. I'm guaranteeing it's going to be a lot of AI being discussed, um, uh, Alation, a company we've been tracking since the foundings, debuting AI co-pilot analytics, Adobe, Adobe's really getting in uh, with AI. I saw some great posts and they have the whole of the photo stuff. And I was even um, at an event last night here in North Carolina and there was a, a bourbon tasting contest. Of course, I had to do a flyby, Dave. Um, <laughs> and the guy, and, the, and the, the guy, well, Jay, Jay's the CIO for SAS, who's just a cool guy. And um, and he's got the customers in there. We were kind of late to the, this event, but uh, we we so we stopped him. Well, the guy who runs the the the, the country club place where they had it, um, he's just just a guy. He's a facilities guy. He does like beverage and you know stuff, or, uh, oversees all that stuff. He's like he was so proud. He showed me uh, the placemats because he put they have different bourbons, like three just small little glasses on this little image with the name or circle. He put the glass on. He goes, I did this all with AI. Okay, that it's awesome. That means. You know, here is a non-techie. This is the utility, right? I think Adobe's going to crush this kind of uh, kind of knowledge worker. You know, here's a beverage manager who's got a bourbon tasting um, event, which they can, created a placemat with Mid Journey, and eyeball the circle, and put the glass on. You can put the glass on with the name. So when the glass is when you lift up the glass, the name of the bourbon's there. My point is, you're starting to see the real world application of where AI is going to just make things better. Kind of like, you know, when we were riffing about the old days of the web, right? Or the PC revolution. I mean, when you use Lotus 1, 2, 3, and then ultimately Microsoft Office on a PC, you're like, wow, this is awesome. Word processor, Excel, uh, PowerPoint, um, WYSIWYG, what you see is what you get interface. That made it real. So I think AI, you're going to see an adoption, right? We're going to see the same progression like the PC revolution, World Wide Web, you're going to see basically the online population grow. So PC is PC users. The more users, the more software gets sold. With the web, the more web users online, the more browsers were installed, right? More websites are built. So I think this that stat is going to be something we're going to track with AI is how much AI usage is there in an application and users? So, you know, users using things like Mid Journey for this, this, this beverage manager. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, you're a, since you're at SAS, let's, let's talk about that a little bit. I, I have three events in my life where SAS, I was, you know, 
was part of my life, if you will. <laughs> when I was in college, in you know, one of our computer science classes, we had to use SAS. You remember we all sort of did use that. It's SAS stands for Statistical Analysis System. And it yeah. was the way that SAS and SPSS were kind of the two systems that we used. So we sort of had to learn it. It was like, a, it was like okay, hey, that's cool. Uh, R is you know, now one of the emerging languages and it has been for, for decade plus. Um, the second was years later, um, when I had my CIO practice with IT Centrics, there was a scotch tasting uh, event for CIOs in Boston. It was scotch, not bourbon. And it was awesome, went in and drank a lot of scotch. And that was, that was fun. And then of course, SAS Explore, John, where we had sort of got a good Kool-Aid injection, although I think they understated sort of the position that they have and the opportunity that they have. And now you're down there, you know, meeting with the execs and the customers and at the, at the SAS Open. Um, you know, this company, I, would, I hope they do an IPO. That'll be fun to watch. Um, this sort of American legend of a company after, you know, five decades going public would be amazing. Yeah, I mean, he's the founder and he's, he has answers to nobody. What's interesting about SAS, um, you know, I'm down here, they have an event. Obviously, they had a golf pro-am tournament. I played two rounds, which is- How'd you do? I did. I did good. I hold out from the middle of the fairway for a hole in one, basically net hole in one on the on the back nine. Nice. How'd you, who did yeah. you play with? Who was your uh, who were you paired? Justin with? Leonard was my or pro this yesterday, and then before that was Patrick Harrington. Both amazing. Patrick Harrington was my favorite, um, and you know all the legends. And you know Justin uh, is only he's only fifty one, so he's young. And Patrick Harrington is I think fifty two. So, you know, these are pros. They, get, they still, they can still rip it. Did you get uh, any tips great. from these guys? Did they? Did oh they... yeah. Yeah. Patrick, Patrick Harrington was the, was all chatty, very cool. Gave us uh, tips. We were here this with, with the CEO of single store, Raj, you know, Raj, right? So Raj uh, is. Raj Verma. Yeah. Raj, but yeah, he, he sponsors Patrick Harrington. So Harrington, as you'll see him on TV, if you watch on golf channel, he's got single store on his Jersey. So obviously he's playing with the sponsor, CEO of the sponsor, who's very cool, you know, Raj. And Raj and his his wingman, Aaron, um, we were all playing together with the CTO of SAS. Um, it was fun. And uh, what I found interesting is, is that I had a conversation with with uh, Patrick Harrington uh, yesterday at breakfast with him, him and um, David Duvall, another legend. And, you know, they just, you know, it's all small talk. What do you do, blah, blah, blah. Well, I really don't, I'm not fit into the mold here. I, I'm, you know, I, Start Silicon Angle, Dave Vellante, The Cube. You got journalism, digital TV, software, AI, and and you know we, we kind of kind of uh, rub against the grain relative to the journalism. And they're like giving me the whole narrative on journalism, because you know D David Duval is a was a Golf Channel um, commentator, and now with ESPN. So these guys, D Duval almost has no social media. Patrick Herring has got only got one hundred fifteen thousand followers. So I kind of gave, I planted the seed in their head. Hey, why don't you combine your social graphs and then you'll be bigger than the golf channel. So like, yeah, that's a great idea. Let's do it. <laughs> so we might do a podcast. Just that's have fun. Great. I might, I might show them how to do a podcast, but um, there's, there's, you know, the, the, these guys, they, they're, they're getting the value of their brand. So these, the senior tour, they call the champions tour is, is very lucrative. I was very surprised at how big it is. Um, and apparently the SAS tournament here has a big purse. So it attracted all the big names. And so I had a chance to, to meet the founder um, and uh, the team and their campus. He owns everything. He actually owns the country club. It's gorgeous, isn't it? I mean, it's beautiful. Yeah. I actually went there one time when I was at IDC. I mean, it's just, it's, you know, the, the Iron Man, part of Iron Man 2, I think, was filmed there. Uh, Iron Man 3, they said, not the 2. Was it 3? Like a, Sorry. I, no, yeah. Not. But he owns all the land. They have daycare. It's very uh, um, employee-centric. Kind of mindset and he you know he has no outside interest it's a private company dave it's not public so you know he can do whatever he wants and he built a culture around academia and the little fun fact is that the google culture the google plex was modeled after sas and i didn't know that really yeah that was a little oh, trivia sure. they actually came down and said how do you guys do it it's, just, it's like a huge campus very uh, academic feel they got a hot they got a um, medical facility on sites and so, so no, no one has to leave campus to go to doctor appointment um, they got daycare healthcare, all on campus 
beautiful, beautiful philosophy. And so you, know, you don't see that anymore in corporate America, do you? you don't see that kind of culture. You know, it reminds me when I graduated in the 80s, um, Hewlett Packard was like that. IBM was kind of like that then. Um, not so much anymore uh, in terms of having like the campuses. Um, so I think it's pretty special company. I mean, I'm very impressed with the culture, but also you, the, they got tech shops. And I think AI is going to be a secret weapon for them because they've been around for so long, Dave, they have all these relationships with customers in all, every single industry vertical. And, you know, we've been saying for years that the data in these vertical markets is where the IP is. And so when, with AI coming down the, the pike fast, they're going to be an opportunity to go to their installed base and just modernize them in, 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 a, in a quick minute. So yeah, I mean, okay. it's going to be very interesting to see how they do that. And, but they're all on it. And you, know, you can see there was got a spring in their step here. They get it and they, and they're going to, they're going to probably drive more value. And, and that can change the landscape of the industry because the old model, if you remember, Dave, they just have to you know, rip and replace old, bring in the new with AI. You can actually abstract away uh, that um, old technology and build bots, co-pilots or, you know, code assistants to manage software and then bring in new data functionality. So it'd be very interesting. Yeah, it, I, what I don't know is, is AI, you know, a, 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 a playing field leveler, uh, or is it something that is actually going to create, you know, greater disparity between the haves and the have nots? You know, there's, there's, there's conversations around the, the lack of talent and how, you know, to get an AI pro, you got to give him or her a million dollar signing bonus. You know, Frank Slootman told me um, at, in, in June, we were talking about the acquisitions that that he made, that Snowflake made, of of, of Neva, and he even commented on uh, on the acquisition of um, Mosaic ML. Like, you know, he didn't crap on it at all. He said, "Dave, <laughs> a big rationale behind these acquisition acquisitions is getting talent, which is kind of, I guess, obvious." But he's, you know, people talk about paying overpaying for that talent. Well, not really. You know, you need to have that or overpaying for these companies, but he's like, it's worth it to get the talent. So will yeah. that create separation or is AI going to be so ubiquitous and widely available and, you know, relatively easy to implement? I don't want to say easy, um, but it's, you know, it does simplify, you know, software development in, in a lot of ways. I, I don't know. What do you think? I think it's going to completely change the game. I think AI will actually, you know, I think if you train AI and treat a code base as data and then import your code, um, it will learn and you can essentially it'll code on its own. You just tell it what to do. So, um, and I think that's going to help in areas where there's short resources. So, you know, you know, I was talking to a guy who used to run um, Citigroup, which is a huge uh, IT shop, billions of uh, overhead that he runs uh, budget wise. He says, you know, they can't hire COBOL programmers. So what they do, they basically train AI to be a COBOL language, so ingest the language, know every syntax. <laughs> Guess what? Then you incor in in incorporate the code base with the language merge, and you now have a smart co-pilot or bot, chat bot, code bot that can code the areas that you would just instruct someone to code. You don't need a COBOL programmer. So that's a gap, obviously, with older technology. So with new technology, I think you're going to see um, a democratization where you don't have to be that person uh, to be that expert. And I think machine learning was that craft, right? If you were a machine learning developer, go back, say, seven years ago or 10 years ago, Dave, you were pretty much a small percentage of the population of coders. Yeah. And then even more, you know, Google, Google was, was always talked privately about how when they do acquisitions, they would count the number of engineers and uh, that new machine learning and, and, and value them at two to 3 million each. And so what companies would do is stockpile ML engineers just to get the M and A going. I got 10. That's hilarious. Oh my you God. Know? They would game They're... the algorithm and get a high evaluation. <laughs> so, Hard. I mean, Smart. So, so I, I think that is true today. If you have talent, okay, and you have AI, then you have a scale there. There. So I think everyone is really figuring this out now, and I think it's really well understood. We've been talking about this 
you know, for the past year. It's not new to us in this conversation, but I'll tell you, in mainstream kind of tech and mainstream society, it's becoming well understood that talent plus AI is better than just talent on its own, clearly, right? So that's going to mean, that's going to apply to every single field. I mean, there's no exceptions with this. It's kind of like, again, like the PC, like the web, the reality is this shift impacts everybody. Okay, I mean, so let me ask you a question because I'm always pimping up the Cube AI. Go to thecubeai.com and, and sign up for private beta. Uh, John will let you in. Uh, when I look at that, I mean, our, our engineers are good, but it's not like they're AI experts, right? They're just good coders. And they're full stack developers, so they you know they pay attention. So they were able to correct me if I'm wrong. Tap open source tooling, leverage MongoDB, leverage open source tools like Milvis, uh, and and actually build the Cube AI. And I, I I mean I use it all the time. It's awesome. Now, so we were able to do that, you know, without you know deep AI expertise. Now, is that going to well, it could actually change our our industry? So that's my point earlier. Is like it's somewhat. This LLMs have, have and, and ChatGPT and BARD and, and these other tools, open source tools, there's dozens and dozens of them, have somewhat democratized AI and made it much more available to a much wider audience. So to me, it comes down to, okay, the, what's, the, what's the model? Who's creative? What can you create that doesn't, didn't necessarily exist before to transform your industry? So if that's true, then it's execution and the clarity of the value that you're going to deliver for your customers, for your community, whatever it is, that is ultimately going to be the, the determinant of winners. And yeah, big some big companies like OpenAI or you know the big cloud guys will come out of the woodworks. I personally think something that we haven't thought of is going to come out and surprise everybody. And I can't obviously predict that what that is. But for mainstream you know companies, you know small guys like us we can now tap the power of those tools to transform industries or at least our business. Yeah, I mean, there's no doubt about it. Well, I mean, I think we get, we do have some experience with some AI around some of the language stuff we were doing in the that's extraction. True. Well, that's time. true, NLP. It's mostly NLP, right? Yeah, it's no, that's true, that's AI, I mean, you're right. So, you you're know, right. we have had chops there. Um, with our team, Narendra and folks, yep. um, definitely have that. I think you got to be careful when you, you might be oversimplifying it because think about like a basic coder, right? In, in a corporation, enterprise, yep. you know, they're coding away and they're just writing code on their application. We we are kind of on the cutting edge. Remember we had the Twitter fire hose with the deal with APIs, we're going cloud native. So, you know, you got to, not everyone's DevSecOps <laughs> native anymore, right? So right. there's still people are doing DevOps, they're just writing applications. So application developers. And you see that in the um, verticals where there's well-known applications in these industry verticals. And that's why, you know, SaaS has got my attention because, you know, they have developer in their markets, right? So they sell to people who are users, right? DevOps users have a whole different breed to themselves, a whole nother animal in my mind. <laughs> to me, if you're doing DevOps cloud native, you're well advanced because you have to learn a lot more up and down the stack. It used to be called full stack developer um, in, in the nomenclature, but with cloud, you have to deal with microservices. So, you know, with services, uh, cloud services versus on-premise monolith kind of concepts, it's just different, right? And then coding, application coder, you're just coding away. It's like, okay, I'm writing code, here's the application. You're relying on someone else to do the platform engineering. So that's the transition that we're in. And again, we talk about this all the time on the cube, but so it's not that easy, but it's going to get easier to your point. What you're really trying to say, and like, I guess what, I, what I'm sensing is, is that you're just saying, Hey, if we can do it, we're not really heavily VC backed. Um, we're agile when we have good people. The argument is the same along when, when Andreessen, Mark Andreessen said the 10 X developer, right? Remember that uh, concept software is eating the world, yeah. you know, with cloud, you have 10x now. You can get, you can have one developer can have the functionality of 10 in the past. That step function value is now moving to AI, where it's not 10x anymore. It's probably like a thousand x, if not completely step function. So the the talent plus AI, if you know that, to me that's the game, right? That's the whole conversation. Like if you have AI, right? That's key. Now, the conversation we talked about last pod, I think we were getting into was the really cool area is what's the role of data 
right? So, you know, everyone's clamoring about vector databases, you know, and, you know, there's going to be more and more vector databases coming out. And I was, I was talking to a single store and they, they already have vector database there in their pro in their platform. It's not like they need to announce it. And they're like, what's the big deal? The vector database is not a company and the embeddings don't work with each other. So what they're, the, 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 the froth and around vector database, in my opinion, is the fact that the role of data is changing radically with AI um, because of the use cases that are now possible. The publish, we published that power law of LLMs, large language models, you have the top proprietary ones, big ones, and then smaller ones are um, coming on the long tail. Every company will have their own foundation and data models, foundation or large language models. So, so that IP, is the companies. So every, if every company has a large language model and a proprietary foundation models, the role of data is changing. That's the real story here, is how you handle data, how data is used and applied uh, will be based upon the, the AI systems that are gonna emerge. And I think that's gonna be coming fast. So you know, no one has that yet, in my opinion. There's no real AI company you go to, there's no, Linux of like like moment for AI. Isn't that no what OpenAI is trying to be? They're the proprietary. <laughs> it's trying. No, you know? Yeah, of yeah. course. But um, yeah, I mean, yeah, you know, but if you're a comp company like us, we have a small language model. You know, yeah, yeah we, we have, have a. <laughs> you know, for us, it's large, but to compare to the world and the power law, we have an SLL. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Uh, yeah, SLL, SLL, large, SLM, small language, small, SLM, SLM, small language model, SL, SLM, SLM, <laughs> small language models, and that's not bad. And by the way, the horsepower, we're seeing some of the stats, the cost issues go down completely if you decompose these language models, the smaller ones, into smaller pieces because they're highly contained and cohesive in the language. So you can get more, if it's valuable, you wouldn't want to pollute it with other, other syntax or other data. Again, so this is, brings up the whole data architecture. I mean, it's almost a mind blowing conversation, Dave, because it's like, well, it'll, if this continues, it'll upend everything that we know about storage and how it's, uh, how databases function, right? I mean, Mongo putting a vector database with their data store makes total sense. It's a feature of a well, platform. This is, this is one of the things that you know, we've been doing with the future of, of data apps and data platforms, using that notion of Uber for all, Uber for the enterprise, where you're basically building a digital representation of your business, you're, inge you're in ingesting data, that data is all different forms, it's structured, it's unstructured, it's different formats and it's different tables, it's, you query it differently, but then you create, you know, a consistent, you know, people say semantics, I don't know if that's the right term, but you're able to join that data in real time to make decisions and take actions for your business. That is a productivity driver that's unprecedented. Eric Brynjolfsson was at UiPath this week as um, one of the keynotes. They had awesome keynote speakers. They had uh, Walter Isaacson, they had Eric Brynjolfsson, you know, tremendous. But anyway, Brynjolfsson, who's an economist at MIT and very well known, he said that he believes that AI will have, a, a, will double productivity. He said it will be at least 3% productivity boost in the relatively near term. He said he'd be disappointed if it didn't beat that. He would expect 4% you know, or higher, which would be amazing. If you can get 4% productivity on the, on the economy, on the global economy, that could potentially <laughs> help solve all these problems of debt if the government would have some kind of fiscal discipline. Um, and that is the wild card right now. But by the way, without that, I think we are in deep shit. Um, you know, notwithstanding all these wars and who knows how to predict that. But to the extent that productivity gains can be seen, that is going to open up new opportunities. It's going to create a flood of money. Um, you know, it could create greater wealth disparity, which is obviously a concern. But right now, the big problem that I see is U.S. debt. You know, one of the number one problem that we have to deal with uh, just in terms of be able to fix some of the challenges we have, you know, around healthcare, for example, or infrastructure or innovation, et cetera. And so that would be huge if Brynjolfsson is, is right. And so, um, I don't know, what do, you, what do you think? I mean, this is, you're saying it's the biggest wave ever. The, that to me, how do you measure that? You measure it with productivity. 
Yeah. And then the number of people using it. So like from a TAM total addressable market perspective, I think the thing that I would look at as an investor and someone looking at a kind of a progress bar is adoption. Uh, how many applications will have AI enabled or AI in them? True AI. I'm not talking about just washing AI over it and saying it's, it's AI, but like legit AI, right? Legit uh, productivity. And so you'll see that. I was actually commenting with Brian Harris, who's the CTO at SAS here. We were playing golf together. Um, great technical group. We had a good good bunch of nerds playing golf together. It's kind of fun. Um, we, we were talking about basically that you can really do great demos with AI. And they do that. They did that at the event, by the way, which, by the way, were demos of real data. And they showed how the data is crossing. So it's a legit AI demo. Okay, so you can actually see the difference in demo. And so that's one hurdle you're going to start to see that being an indicator of pretenders versus the players. So the pretenders won't have good demos, okay? Because you can actually do good demos with AI because that's the benefit of AI. The challenge that's new, the net new challenge with the AI wave, Dave, is going from killer demo or app to scale and production. And so the all the conversation in Silicon Valley and in the AI industry and cloud right now is how do you move AI from you know, great application that works with some data or some scale to moving it into a production environment where you have a lot more scale, a lot more data is needed. So, you know, as we know with ChatGPT, it's garbage in, garbage out, meaning you're only as good as the data you're providing. So at scale with AI, you're going to have to manage massive amounts of data, the right data, a volume of data, velocity of data. So it's going to be a challenge. And I think that's going to be the conversation probably for the next two years. Who's in production with what, and what does that look like? And your point about usage and adoption is right on. I mean, you know, my rap about productivity, you're, you're peeling the onion one layer down. How do you get productivity? You get productivity through usage and adoption. Usage of tech and applications is what drives value. It's what makes people more productive. And the other thing to think about is if you go back 30, 40, 50 years, the percent of time that users spend, employees spend, first of all, the percentage of employees that have access to technology and the percent of time that they spend using that technology has gone from, you know, small percentage of back office, you know, workers back in the 60s, 70s, and, and, and then the 80s with the PC productivity, it went much, much higher. But still, people spend time doing other things. Today, a huge percentage of people's time is spent on you know, using technology and the impact of that usage is much, much higher. Just think about what happens. The way Floyer and I used to measure this when we had you know, our CIO consultancy was what happens, we would ask organizations and employees, we would do these time and, you know, time and motion studies, what happens when your, your access to this application goes down? If you ask that to a claims processor, an insurance company, she or he's going to say, uh, I don't do anything, I can't do my job. Um, and so, you know, think about when you lose email. Um, it doesn't happen that often, but it does happen. Think about it when you're, you know, hacked. Uh, th that is a massive productivity impact. It just underscores how much productivity technology drives. So to the extent that you can increase that to Brynjolfsson's forecast, double, you know, that productivity, you know, uh, 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 gain from, let's say where it is now, 2% to 4%, that is, massive in terms of the economic impact on the global economy. I totally agree. Well, I mean, let's let's go through our rants here. Obviously my rant uh, is one rant, it's a small rant. It's the whole war and Israel, Israel situation. My heart goes out to all the founders who have companies uh, there and in the US and also companies that have employees there um, and people have relatives there and on both sides. It's really kind of it, 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 unimaginable. Um, I stand with Israel. That's my personal perspective. I think um, they, they get invaded and have to take action. Um, and then my 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 segue into the rant on in the industry is, you know, there's there's still layoffs happening, Dave. There's you know more layoffs coming from Flexport. We saw a bunch of other layoffs coming in from companies. Juniper laying off 440 employees. Um, so interesting layoffs there. Um, yeah, I mean, it's going to be a weird time. Qualcomm said it's going to lay off more than 1,200 people in California. Um, just a lot of issues you know, going on in the tech industry. So, yeah, I hope we can get around that. And I hope we can get some data that will give us an indicator of what's going on with the economy. Um, so that's my rant. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, on on the war, I, I would just it's very complicated, as we know, situation in the Middle East. One of the most impactful books that I've ever read, and if you haven't read it, I would encourage people to read it, is The Lemon Tree. Um, many might dismiss that at this point in time because you know the horrific incident and incidents that have occurred and are occurring in Israel, but it's um, it's a very thought-provoking um, uh, piece of work, the lemon tree. Um, for my rant, Activision Microsoft finally closed today. Uh, I, I feel as though that was, it's like the exception that proves the rule, the exception being the government's actually allowing, the governments around the world allowing this to go through, the, the time it took and the pain it took um, and the concessions that were, were made, they, they could have been made, I think would have been made up front had two things, uh, takes, takes two to tango, you know, how ironic. But, but up front, if the, if the government had a you know, stronger relationship and more supportive relationship of big tech, and at the same time, a big tech, big tech had more of an open mind to the fact that you have a monopoly so you, you cannot use that monopoly power to, uh, to advance your position at the expense of the industry. And that's a, those are both you know, opposite sides of the equation. Bring them together. Right now, the, the you know, US, I guess it's the DOJ, or maybe it's the FTC. I, I get so confused with all these lawsuits. But, but basically the FTC is, is their, no, it's, it's, it's the FTC, their position on, on Amazon is, let's start with breakup. Um, and then, you know, Amazon's position is to dig their heels in and say, no effing way we're going to break up the company. That's bullshit, not for you to decide. And so, again, Amazon's got to realize, hey, you've probably done some things that weren't cool. So admit that and come up to an agreement with the DOJ or FTC. I, I can't remember. I think they're both after them. I think right now it's the DOJ. At any rate, come to an agreement, meet in the middle, and actually keep it out of the courts and the headlines. And that is going to foster a better public-private relationship that's going to help us in so many ways. And I don't know, maybe that's just a pipe dream, uh, but it's something that I think we should endeavor to support. The, uh, great, great, uh, Rand, as always. Um, yeah, I mean, let's talk about... Um, couple things you were at the UI event this week in Vegas how'd that go we got oh, super clever yeah. I mean, uh, UI path UI path fantastic event always fun you know UI path was a company that their series F I think was a 38 billion dollar valuation they went public didn't go so well they're probably trading at a 10 billion dollar valuation now but they brought in Rob Enslin who's the was the co-CEO now he's essentially the CEO uh, from Google uh, he has he is a go-to-market pro uh, he's very focused. It's allowed Daniel Denays, the visionary founder, to really focus on product, and he is a visionary. He's been doing AI for a long, long time. I know everybody says that just as a proof point. They bought a company called Reinfer, Natural Language Processing, before ChatGPT was was announced, and so it wasn't like scrambling because they had an event coming up. It was they saw it as a fundamental component of their platform. They've shifted from a point tool RPA to a platform of automation. Now at the same time. Uh, AI is is eating away at some of their TAM. I mean, John, I, you know me, I've been talking every time I go to UiPath events, I'm like, hey, John, we could use RPA to do like auto clipping and, 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 and streamline our workflows. Well, guess what? We're not doing that without RPA. <laughs> We're doing that with AI and large language models and we you know, kind of built it ourselves. So there is that component where it's eating away, AI is eating away at some of their TAM. At the same time, they were smart enough to say, look, we, can, we have to go beyond point tool, build a platform so that we can you know, drive end-to-end -end what they call hyper automation, which is you know, very high value, many more people accessing automation. So that was really what the you know, event was all about, is what kind of progress they're making there. And when you talk to customers, you know, what's happening is, is this is still largely a back office function. The opportunity is to move that throughout the organization to the front office, and that's a, just a, a massive total available market opportunity. And uh, I really like these, this company. I sat down one-on-one -on -one with Daniel Denez, the, the founder, super humble guy. I, I say humility, and I, I don't mean that as a sign of weakness. 
He's bold, he takes big, makes big bets, but yeah. he's just a really thoughtful individual and somebody that I've enjoyed getting to know over the years. Yeah, that's awesome. And again, every app is trying to figure out their generative AI strategy or their generative AI something. And uh, those guys have always been ahead of the curve. RPA has always been that category that's kind of doing it. But right now, again, the startups that are out there and, and the, some of the commentary in the elite circles are at least that people are just creating something that sits on top of OpenAI or ChatGPT 3 or 4. Um, and you know, now we got the vector database search kind of buzz. Yeah, I think, but I think there's going to be a real new thing that's going to come out of this which is you know around neural networks right Dave I think that's going to be you know where because you know, everything's talking about like search and retrieval rag is a term they use um getting data to have memory and 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 data to have intelligence is gonna have to have a new system and that's what we're watching on and I'm looking for that big time right like that's I'm out there like with my goggles on like you know, binoculars looking out in the field saying you know who's moving the needle right um and the gap between demo and production, uh, building anything with machine learning is, is just too big right now. And that's what everyone's talking about. So we're going to keep tracking it. Uh, we're going to be at SuperCloud 4 in two weeks. So we're going to be live stage performance in Palo Alto on our Generative AI SuperCloud event. And let's let's get pumped for that. Yeah, so SuperCloud 4 is, uh, is going to be awesome. I mean, look, if you guys are local to, I think I, we're getting pretty full, John, but still, you know, if you're local to Palo Alto, let us know. You know, we can always, what we did with SuperCloud 3 is we had so much demand for people coming into the studio, we created a second day and we can do that again. We've, we've allocated that time and we would welcome, if you've got a really good angle here, you know, let us know. And then of course, reInvent's coming up. Of course, we have the, uh, the, the, the DP3, uh, we're doing a data protection series with our friends at Dell. This will be the third in the series um, out of our Palo Alto studio. It's a super studio sort of format like we did with Vast Data, like we did with, with IBM. So headed by uh, Rob Emsley, who's uh, the, the, the marketing lead over there and a guy named Michael Wilkie. So they're doing some really interesting work. Our guy, Greg Gotts is, is participating very extensively. We get the support from our friends at Broadcom. So that's that's been an awesome, and it's, this is going to be a community event. It's not just like pimping. We don't, we're not pimping, you know, Dell per se. We're talking about it's thought leadership and, you know, we'll let them pimp their products. So we're, we're sort of setting the groundwork for thinking about uh, uh, data protection as an adjacency to cybersecurity. So that's, that's another thing that people should look out for. All right, well, Dave, I'm going to call it a day. We've got the top of the hour here, a little shorter pod than normal. Being leaving together, I got to go. I mean, Zoom, anything's possible. This could crash. It went, went that far with only one glitch. Um, thanks thanks for taking the time and making around my schedule. Awesome Here seeing you, John. Good luck. Good luck in the course today. Crush it, bro. Right, no, I'm not I'm not playing golf today, so <laughs> like I'm working. You must be <laughs> sore. You, you must be sore from all that oh, golf. Oh, <laughs> God, no. I'm, I'm, uh, I got this. I got this. All right, all right we'll see you. See you, man. See you later.